This interview is part of the Oral History Project sponsored by the State Bar of New Mexico and its Senior Lawyers Division. I'm Sarah Bradley, a member of the Senior Lawyers Division of the State Bar. Today is August 23rd, 2007, and I'm interviewing William H. Darden at his home in Raton, New Mexico. Uh, Mr. Darden, is there anything about your childhood or early adolescence that influenced the direction of your life? Well, I suppose the main thing was that my father was a lawyer, and uh, I grew up in a, a, an atmosphere of the law. My father had started out practicing in Alabama before World War I, uh, and one of his associates and uh, friends in the bar back there was Hugo Black, who later became United States Supreme Court Justice. He moved here after, well, he was in World War I, and he moved here into New Mexico after the war, first to Clayton, and uh, spent about a, m a year in Clayton practicing law. And he met lawyers in Raton. Raton was a booming place at that time and uh, needed lawyers. And uh, so he came to Raton and worked for a law firm of Crampton and Phillips uh, and later joined the firm. Mr. Crampton is an old-time lawyer here, had come before the statehood and uh, was a very respected lawyer. Uh, Phillips, uh, Ori Phillips, later became a, a federal judge in Albuquerque, and then after that became a Supreme, I mean, a, uh, a circuit court judge in Denver. Uh, I was a so with that I associated with a lot of lawyers, knew all the lawyers in town, and uh, I guess that sort of thing influenced me that uh, the law was a good thing to do. And uh, I know my dad uh, wanted me to be a lawyer, and uh, my brother also, I have a younger brother, Bob, who was also a member of the New Mexico Bar at one time. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, my father died when I was 16 years old, and I uh, didn't have a more mature time to be with him and understand more about the law. But uh, I decided to go to law school. I went to my undergrad at uh, Boulder, University of Colorado, and, and went to law school there. Were there any professors or <clears throat> other role models there that uh, were well, a particular I, influence? I was. Uh, I had one very interesting professor at Boulder. His name was P. I. Folsom. Folsom Field, a football field, is named after him. He came to Boulder as a football coach, but he had been a lawyer in Pennsylvania, I think it was, somewhere back there, and. Uh, so he finally joined the faculty in the law school. He was a very exacting uh, professor in class. Everyone had to stand up to recite. He would call on you. He had a, a file of cards, and there weren't very many of us in this class, about, oh, about 25, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd shuffle these cards every morning and uh, pick out a card and call on you. And uh, of course we're using the case system and uh, you had to uh, recite your information about various cases and, uh, and then he might let you go after a minute or two and, and make, might make you recite the whole class. I had that happen more than once where he would uh, for the whole hour, he'd be quizzing me or quizzing somebody else at, at times. Uh, he was a very interesting fellow and uh, influential. Uh, interesting enough for New Mexico people, uh, Henry Weihofen, who was later a professor at the new University of New Mexico Law School, you may have known him, uh, he was I taught in Boulder before the war when he was a professor of mine then. Uh, but, uh, uh, and then there was a fellow named Fred Stork, who was a 
very influential and professional uh, lawyer and uh, teacher, you might say. Uh, he was incapacitated physically, uh, but uh, very sharp uh, mentally. He was a great lawyer and, and influenced me too. Did, did they have any influence in the field of law you decided to uh, sort of focus upon? I didn't focus on any field of law. I came here and uh, practiced law. A sole practitioner uh, started out, and uh, I, I took pretty much what came in the door. Uh, shortly before I uh, came back to law, uh, to practice law here, the mines began to go downhill. They got this uh, com competition from uh, uh, the petroleum industry and oil. The railroad was changing over to oil from coal. The town was going over to oil. Uh, people were stopping using coal furnaces and stuff like that. So the mines were going down hill. And uh, so there was quite a bit of unemployment. And uh, so uh, I took what came in the door. Did, were you mentored at all by any of, say, your father's contemporaries? Yeah, there was a fellow named Hugh Roderick who uh, had an office in the same building that I had my office in. He was a real old time codger. <laughs> bachelor. And uh, when I had a question, I'd go up to see him. Well, unfortunately, I, he, that just started him talking. And even though I didn't have a whole lot of practice, uh, I still didn't have time to listen to him all day. Uh, but for a while, I took his advice and uh, went just to see him every once in a while about problems. And, uh, but if finally I had to cut him off. I, I could no longer uh, take the time to listen to old Hugh. But he was quite a character. What was the practice like in a small town? Well, uh, Raton had a number of corporations. Uh, the coal company was a big corporation and had its lawyers. Uh, the banks, of course, had their lawyers. And... Uh, there were stockmen around uh, in the area uh, who had business with lawyers. Uh, it was a pretty, pretty diversified uh, practice. Uh, as time went on, I got involved in, in corporate work and, and uh, a lot of real estate work. I guess I did more real estate work than anything else. I uh, um, handled divorces. And uh, then uh, I got involved in uh, as an assistant district attorney. Back in those days, in uh, uh, oh, 1947 is when I began began uh, practicing. Uh, both the district attorneys in the state and the assistant district attorneys were part time. You could uh, have a private practice on the side. So I got involved in uh, an assistant district attorney and did a lot of work that way. And the district attorney handled uh, children's court stuff, and we handled uh, uh, the, uh, represented the county in its county work. We uh, handled, of course, all sorts of criminal cases. Uh, so it was pretty diversified, too. I noticed you mentioned it was 1947 that you went to work yes. in the DA's office. Had the war no, I, interrupted I didn't go to, your I, practice? Uh, no. I had not quite finished law school when, I, when the war came along. And I was, went into the service and uh, spent four years in the service. And then I came out and finished law school and then started practicing. It might be a, and might be of some interest, too, too to, to tell exactly how that worked. Uh, I finished law school in 
April of 1947. Uh, I didn't actually get my degree and everything until graduation time, but I went, came home uh, after finishing law school and going to take a break because I had uh, been working real hard to try to get through law school and all. I came home and uh, wanted to take a break, but then it turned out that the bar exam was going to be held. Let me see, the bar exam was uh, in uh, March uh, the 26th. I finished law school on the 10th of March, 1947. And so I had to get ready for the darn bar exam. And I really poured the coal to that. I took the bar exam, and uh, it was a three-day bar exam, and the uh, fourth day of the bar exam, they announced who was being admitted. There was no big, long delay like there is now. I became a member of the bar the fourth day of my uh, taking the bar exam. Uh, well, I was pretty pooped by that time. And I uh, came home, and I was not married then. I lived at home with my mother. and. Uh, started relaxing. Well then, I found out that the April term of court was coming up. And in those days, they had two, two terms of court, an, a, a, a spring court and a, an autumn court usually, and sometimes an extra court around Christmas time. Um, Did you have circuit judges that would? N no, they didn't really circuit. Well, uh, the district judge here had three counties, like he has now. Uh, moved around, but it wasn't strictly a circuit. And uh, so every lawyer in town was expected to be at the opening of the term of court. And uh, so I went down as a fresh new member of the bar, and uh, the first thing that came up was there was a widely uh, publicized a murder case, a carjacking, basically. And uh, the judge, um, oh, what was his name? Uh, he, was from, he, was, he was from uh, Clayton, was presiding, and so uh, this person came up for arraignment and appointment of a lawyer, and he didn't have a lawyer and couldn't afford one. So the judge says, well, I'm going to appoint a couple of lawyers for you. And he appointed a fellow by the name of Bill Kearns, who had been admitted to the bar the six, six months prior to the time when I was, and me. Oh, gosh. <laughs> we were appointed to defend this first-degree murder case. Uh, so that... Uh, happened, and then uh, he says, and we'll go to trial on the 21st of April. <laughs> That's how much time we had to prepare for this case. And neither of us, well, Kernzen had never had any murder cases before. He'd had a little bit of practice before, but, uh, and I'd had none. And we had to learn how to practice law pretty fast there. And in those days, they didn't have a public defender's oh, office. Oh, no, there was no public defender. Investigators no. or anybody no. provided to you, was there? No. And it was interesting, of course, there was no Miranda ruling then either. Uh, this fellow had uh, killed a traveling salesman, stolen his car, and uh, put him in a culvert out east of town and shot him to death in the culvert and taken off the car. And he was captured down back in Indiana, and uh, using the guy's credit card. And uh, so uh, he sort of confessed back there to what he had done, and they sent back the sheriff and the assistant district attorney, a fellow by the name of John Wright, who later became a district judge here. And uh, they went back to bring this fellow back to Raton. Uh, a couple of three days in the car, they were talking to him about this case all the time. No lawyer to protect him or anything, of course. 
and he even showed them the place where uh, he had killed this man, and they found the body. And that was kind of, and, and then they got some written statements from him also. So that's the kind of case we had to try. <laughs> How long did that jury trial go? Uh, or was it a jury trial? Oh yes, so. we went. We had a jury trial. Oh, I think about three, four days is all, not too long, and uh, the jury convicted him. Uh, but we appealed it. Kearns and I appealed it to the Supreme Court, and uh, we went to the Supreme Court the next winter. And an interesting thing, uh, at that time the Supreme Court building and all, most of Santa Fe was uh, heated by gas, but the gas supply had had an interruption or something when the schedule for our trial, uh, for, for our hearing was going to happen. And uh, they tell me this is the first time that the Supreme Court has ever met outside of its own chambers. But we went over to the La Fonda Hotel, which had a coal furnace, and uh, so we could keep warm in the hearing. <laughs> What other cases in your career stand out in your memory? Oh, let me see. Uh, well, I don't know really. Uh, I uh, let me see. I have some notes here. Well, this was not a really a case, but I have a client who uh, was a wholesaler for uh, petroleum products. And uh, he called me one night and said that uh, he was conferring with some people about a deal that he'd like for me to sit in on and see, advise him about it. Well, it turned out that these people were from down around now, Marillo, and they claimed that they had, uh, they, they were in the business of selling uh, propane tanks and that they had a customer up in Utah uh, who wanted to buy a bunch of tanks, but he didn't have any uh, real good credit rating, and they wanted somebody who would uh, co-sign his note. And uh, they were going to give my client something in, uh, in order to uh, uh, sign. They wanted him to co-sign the note. and. Uh, of course, I told him that you're sticking your nose away out there. You better not do that. So he didn't do it. Well, I think within uh, a month of that time, the Billy Saul Estes case broke. I don't know if you ever heard of Billy Saul Estes, but this was Billy Saul Estes and his crew. They were trying to defraud my client out of well, fifty thousand bucks. I think it was worth of tanks. Oh my! And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> Indeed. In, in practicing in a small town like Raton, are you able to call opposing counsel over the phone, or are things still kept on a fairly formal basis? Oh, back then we did. I, I don't know what they're doing now, but uh, oh yeah, back in, when I was practicing law, we were in good terms with most of the lawyers in town. And uh, we'd talk to them, and sometimes even about cases and stuff. But uh, it was uh, not, I wouldn't say it was, we were very formal about it generally. Who were the, the same people that were on the opposite side of cases with you, social friends? Oh, yes, uh, a lot of them, yeah. I guess you would say my best friend was Bob Skinner. And we fought all the time. Did you know Bob? I did. Yeah, we went to. Uh, he finished law school at Boulder at the same time I did, and uh, I've known him for, of course, known him for his whole time he's here. And uh, there were other lawyers, Paul Castor, uh and uh, John Davidson. And, uh, Gordon Robertson, I don't know if you know him or not, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of us had gone to Boulder. At that time, there wasn't any law school in at Albuquerque, so we went to law school 
in Boulder, and so that's at one time there were five of us in the bar locally that were CU grads. Did you remain as a sole practitioner? Yeah, all the time. Uh, I never got around to teaming up with anybody. I, and there I, were other sole practitioners around here too. I would assume that as tight-knit as the bar was, if you had questions, there was always somebody you could brainstorm with? Well, I wouldn't say that really, no. I, I did my own research. And uh, I don't think, except when I was just getting started with Omar and Roderick, I, uh, I don't think I really consulted with anybody else very much about it. Were you ever involved in uh, politics, either? Yeah, I uh, started out uh, very short, shortly after I got out of school and started practicing law. We had a city election come up, and uh, some of the big the Democratic uh, uh, bigwigs uh, decided they'd uh, get me to run for mayor. Uh, so they talked me into it. I had some reservations, but they talked me into, uh, into running for mayor. And uh, so I made some speeches around town, and uh, I guess they didn't care very much about what I was thinking about for the city. They did. First place, they probably wanted me to do what they said. Uh, so they turned against me, and uh, I lost by 100 votes, I think it was. <laughs> And that was your one foray into politics? Well, no. After that, I ran for probate judge, and uh, uh, I served two terms as probate judge. But those are the only times I was really involved in politics. And even the probate judge, you ran for election? Oh, yes. Yeah. And it was, of course, part-time work also. Was that strictly county-wide, or was, was it county, for the whole district? That was a county uh, office, yeah. Uh, you started talking about an association with the DA's office. All right. Well, I, I served as an assistant district attorney for, uh, oh, about 20 years, I guess, uh, a part-time. Uh, in 1977, the law was changed and required district attorneys and assistant district attorneys to be full-time employees. Well, it just happened that uh, at that particular time, uh, I lost two or three clients who had retired or died or moved away, important clients, and uh, uh, my business has kind of had a hole in it. Uh, I had, as I say, over 20 years uh, as assistant district attorney, so I had a lot of time for retirement piled up. And I was getting ready to retire anyway. Catherine and I don't have any children and we wanted to travel and uh, do things on our own. And uh, so I decided to go full time in the DA's office. So I spent three years as a full time assistant DA. And uh, during all that time, I, of course, prosecuted many, many cases murder cases, uh, all sorts of cases, rape cases. Was it was mostly, uh, was it mostly criminal or was it mostly representing the county on issues? Well, I'd say it's mostly criminal. Uh, representing the county mostly consisted of attending the county commissioner's meetings and uh, sort of ad hoc advising them. Uh, we didn't have any, I don't recall, any big litigation as far as the county was concerned. Uh, tell me a little about your family. You mentioned your father was a lawyer mm -hmm. and you have a brother who's a lawyer. Well, I have a bro brother who, he was a government lawyer and he, he was the uh, attorney for the Small Business inf in Information, excuse me, the small business uh, administration. administration. 
in Albuquerque for a number of years. Uh, I know there are also some Dardens in Las Cruces. All right, and I have a second cousin uh, and his uh, son, John Darden, who lives there still. Uh, Byron Darden was his father, and uh, they were uh, my second cousin. Byron was my second cousin. His father was a lawyer before him, too, back in Alabama. <laughs> Okay, so the, the, the Darden family originated in Alabama then? Well, where they were there for a long time, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, and my brother then, uh, he retired, lived in Albuquerque for quite a while after he retired, and then he moved to Connecticut. What are your primary uh, interests or involvements outside of law? Hobbies, you mean, and stuff? Sure. Well, I, of course, I read a lot. I have a lot of books. I, uh, in the past, I've been interested in photography. Uh, I've been interested in some uh, astronomy, home, uh, backyard astronomy. Uh, I used to do a lot of fly fishing, and uh, you mentioned you and then travel. I was going to say you mentioned travel. Yeah. Uh, Catherine and I have been. Oh, Europe, well, we've been to Europe seven times. Been to uh, Egypt, been through the Panama Canal. And we've been in all the states except Alaska and Hawaii, and uh, we've enjoyed it. Now you're pretty much sticking close to home? I have to stick pretty close to home now, because as I say, Catherine had a stroke uh, about five years ago, and, and it incapacitated her, and so we stick pretty close to around home now. Are you still involved in any local associations? I, I still belong to Kiwanis Club, which I belonged to for over 50 years. Uh, and we're involved in our church, Presbyterian Church. And uh, I go to lunch on Friday with a group of guys that uh, we've been going some of us have been going to lunch together for since 1947. Yeah. Uh, we've had new additions from time to time because we lost a lot of people, but uh, so I get around that way. How, how would you say the practice or the legal community in Raton has changed during your career? Well, I'm not sure exactly how it's changed. I don't, I don't think it has changed too much. We have, still have a fairly small bar, 10 to 12 members and most of the time. And uh, I thought, always thought it was a pretty high quality bar. Uh, the people were uh, not too greedy, didn't try to go out and, and uh, uh, take everybody's money and that sort of thing. Uh, very few... Uh, really tort uh, cases of any big serious nature. I think that's true, tr still true. Uh, I would say it's a pretty good class bar. Do, do most of the lawyers here have licensure in Colorado as well? Do you sort of, well, since I don't, you're so close? I don't, no, I don't think so. Uh, no, Paul Kastler does, uh, but I don't think they do. Uh, I'm not sure, really, because some of them are, I haven't practiced against them at all, you know. I, some of them are, came here long after I retired, but... Uh, when did you retire? I retired in 1980, and so it's been 27 years, right. so there's a lot of new blood in here. Right. Who are some of the people you have lunch with on Fridays? Well, I, none of no lawyers. Oh. Uh, it's uh, mostly uh, it was veterans that uh, we started out with together, and most of them are veterans now. Huh. Uh, what would you say is your most significant contribution to law? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That I I uh, appealed a couple of cases to the Supreme Court that made law, uh, not. So significant law, but uh, 
I guess you'd say that was uh, uh, some significance. And uh, one of them, I say, uh, one was a very strange case. I, I'm surprised that the uh, that it happened at all. I was involved in a uh, a case on a big foreclosure of a uh, housing project, and I represented uh, the uh, electrician who had not been paid, and uh, he had a good friend who was the plumber there. I brought suit for the uh, electrician, and they finally talked me into representing the the uh, plumber also uh, on the agreement that uh, I would, my first my first uh, responsibility was to my electrician friend. Uh, so we uh, filed a motion for intervention, and it was granted by the uh, trial court. But the other side appealed to the Supreme Court. And uh, their appeal was on the basis that uh, uh, after the lower court had uh, accepted the intervention, that uh, I had not filed a separate uh, uh, complaint for the uh, uh, for the plumber. Well, as you probably know, the in making an intervention, you have to submit your pleading that you're going to try to intervene with. So we went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, had never decided this case before. Uh, New Mexico hadn't, but they decided that you didn't have to do two things uh, separately. Once you filed that uh, petition and showed your uh, what your case was about, you didn't have to separately serve the other side with a new thing just like it. And this was back in the time, of course, when there was a lot of trouble to make a copy. You had to, if you hadn't made a copy already with a carbon copy, you had to start and file a, uh, type the whole thing over again and that sort of thing. We didn't have any copying machines or anything. But I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. I guess they still go by it. I would think. Did you have a, a series of secretaries over the years, or did you I do had, your own? Her, she was my secretary most of the time. So I had had others, but uh, we we didn't get married until we were fairly up in years, and uh, so when we got married, well, she started being my secretary. I didn't buy, mar I didn't mar marry her for that reason, though. <laughs> So a real family business, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, is there any other aspects of your career or your life that you'd like to share? Well, let me see here if I can think of anything else. Well, like everybody my age, uh, our experiences in the war was a, a, a big thing. Uh, and uh, I was an officer in a combat engineer battalion, it served both in uh, Europe and in the Philippines. But uh, having had a couple of years of law school uh, before that, well, I always got appointed on a court-martial. And I was always, in addition to my other duties, was uh, either a counsel, mostly counsel, and a court-martial of various sorts. I remember one case in Germany. We were trying a guy for a murder of a civilian, and uh, we uh, got about half the way through our case. Uh, there was another fellow with me, and uh, we took off a couple of days for something, I don't know what, and uh, reconvened. And during the time that uh, we had been absent, our star witness had been murdered himself. Oh, my. <laughs> so we had a, quite an experience there. And uh, there were things like that occurred everywhere, of course. But. 
She actually had some training in, in trial work then before you ever even got through law school. Yeah. Yeah, you would say so, yeah. yeah probably four years out of it. But it was different. In the, uh, well, it was different in, in, uh, in one way. Uh, the military had uh, developed a word-by-word -word, uh, resume of what you would say in court in these cases. And every once in a while I'd run into somebody who wanted to go by the book. And it, it was not always the best way of trying a case. Uh, but generally I got away with uh, using good legal uh, system to uh, try these cases. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it didn't work out too well. I had a case when I was down in Mississippi, the uh, commanding officer of this company was notified by the first sergeant that uh, one of their privates wouldn't get, out, get, up, get up out of bed uh, one morning and refused to get out of bed. And the captain told the first sergeant, uh, you go over there and tell this guy to get out of bed or I'm going to court martial him. Well, the uh, first sergeant went over and apparently said, uh, you get out of bed or you're going to get court martialed. I think the captain intended that uh, he say, the captain says you get out of bed or you're going to be court martialed, but he didn't do it. Anyway, the captain uh, uh, filed a, a suit, or the filed a court-martial against him for disobeying the uh, verbal command of a, a superior officer. Well, uh, I was preparing this case and I needed to go down to headquarters to look at some law books and I bumped a ride with the executive officer of the battalion who was going down there also. And on the way down in our jeep, well, he asked me what I was doing. I said I was getting ready for this case. And, and he says, well, that man has to be convicted. I was defending him, you see. Uh, and uh, I sat in a gulp, and I said, well, I'm going to try to def get him off and defend him. And he says, he has to be, def he has to be convicted. We've got to make an <laughs> issue of this. Well, we went to trial. And uh, I brought up this question, and the uh, court martial board agreed with me and, and uh, quitted this guy. I think it was about 10 days later I got transferred. Oh. <laughs> Did you want me in that outfit anymore? <laughs> Did you uh, work at all in, in uh, you said you were in a, the, an engineering yeah. division? Combat you, engineers. Yeah. Uh, so were you involved in building of bridges and oh that yes. sort of thing? Oh yeah. All bridges. over Europe and Europe and and we went to the Philippines and <coughs> got there just just before the war was over. So they put us to work building a big camp for uh, American soldiers. They were they'd been in Manila for almost a year and they had leases on a bunch of buildings in downtown Manila and the people wanted their buildings back. So the army decided to build this big, big camp for them, and uh, so we built that. But uh, in Europe, uh, we one winter in Eng in England, we spent almost all winter building bridges across the Thames River. We'd build a portable bridge across the, the Thames one day, tear it down that night, build it, rebuild it again. We build those bridges time after time. We've got pretty good building bridges, I'll tell you. <laughs> what would you say to encourage younger <coughs> lawyers to come to some of the smaller outlying uh, communities in New Mexico to practice law? Well, uh, it's not the dog-eat-dog, -dog, clawing, uh, aggressive uh, sort of thing that I think a lot of the law is in a big city. I, I don't speak from first 
knowledge about big city ball, but I get the impression that it's pretty dog-eat-dog -dog in a place like Albuquerque. Uh, here, I don't think that's true. It wasn't when I was practicing law. <coughs> uh, it's, um, I think it's a rewarding deal. You know people so well, people know you, and uh, if you're any good, you get have some respect from the public generally. And, uh, and among other members of the bar, you have a, a much better relationship because you are dealing with them all the time and you know them. And I think that uh, there's a lot to be said for it. I know that uh, a lot of lawyers want to all the excitement of a big city, but uh, we have excitement here and things to do. We have a very active uh, theater uh, program here, live theater, and there are things to do. Um, so it's not, uh, you're not just giving up everything in order to be in a small town. Well, it seems that there's a real uh, tight-knit community, uh, both of lawyers and then with Business the lawyers men. with the community itself yes. that maybe is missing other places. Yeah. I think that's true. Uh, I'm getting awful dry. Can we quit for a while? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Darden, I understand that uh, you are a collector of wonderful books. <laughs> Well, I, I consider them uh, wonderful. Uh, I've bought a lot of books, some of them good books and some not so good, but uh, I've got some that are my pride and joy. As a lawyer, I, when I was in England during the war, I bought a first, first complete edition of Blackstone's Commentaries. I'm the saying Oxford that. edition, which is the original edition, there were first editions of Oh, from Dublin and London and uh, all over, but the original uh, was the Oxford edition. And uh, do you I have that? Could you show those to yes, us? Yes, I. This is the volume one, which, incidentally, is a, a third edition. Uh, Blackstone wrote his first two volumes and printed them, had them published uh, before he finished the work. And the last two volumes, which I have also, uh, were uh, published later. Uh, and I have those as first editions. But this is, this is the uh, third edition here from Oxford. And as you can see, it's very fine paper. It, it's, this was published in uh, 1768. And you see the paper is just as soft and nice as it ever was. The, and uh, did you use that during your practice? Yes, I did use it at times uh, because the, uh, the common law of the United States uh, is the common law of England as it's been amended uh, later by statute. But uh, a lot of our law is still common law, and under the Constitution, the common law of the United States was the common law of England in the, when the United States was formed. And uh, it just happened that uh, Lord Black Blackstone had, uh, uh, had written this magnificent book about the commentaries on the laws of England uh, just prior to that. So. Everybody's accepted the fact that uh, this is uh, the law of the United States. Um, before my time, uh, every lawyer had a uh, copy of uh, Blackstone's commentaries in it. Usually, though, they uh, had the name of some annotator on them, like Chitty on Blackstone and, and that sort of thing. Uh, that were annotated with uh, new United States cases that uh, upheld the common law of England. Uh, but uh, the, uh, 
went on, and of course some of it's been amended by statute. Did you go specifically looking for these? Yes, I did. Uh, my brother uh, was in the Air Force, and he got overseas before I did. And he wrote back uh, and said that he had bought a Blackstone uh, in, his was a Dublin edition, I think, and uh, he really proud of it. And that's where I decided, well, I'll get, I'll beat him, I'll get a good one. And uh, so I went, I was going to leave one day, and I went to, uh, Sharon, uh, to um, oh, heck was the name of the famous street that uh, all the legal book sellers were, uh, had their places. And uh, I went to this store, and he had a number of these things. I was surprised, that, uh, uh, but mine apparently is owned at one time by Kenneth A. McAndrew, his book plates in this. And uh, I guess people turned them in and tried to sell them later. Uh, maybe people that weren't really lawyers. I don't know how this got into circulation. Huh. But uh, as you can see, it's beautifully bound in calf. And uh, I think a very valuable book. Right. And you actually quoted from that in some of your cases? I have. I, uh, in fact, uh, let's see, uh, was it, there was a district judge from Santa Fe up here one time. We were trying to, a case he had, been, uh, he had been appointed in. And I think something came up about the common law. He was in a criminal case. Uh, and maybe involved in the definition of various grades of murder. There was some confusion about it, and there was at that time confusion in uh, the New Mexico law on exactly what the definition of the various grades of murder were. And uh, so I came home. I didn't keep this in my office. I came home and got this and took it back and showed him. So that's it. Ah. Well, what other particularly uh, outstanding uh, volumes have well, you managed I have, to collect? Well, I have an incunabulum, uh, which means a cradle book. A cradle book was uh, a book printed in the first half century of printing after Gutenberg, in other words, uh, up until 1500. And my uh, book I have uh, was printed in, in 14... Uh, 97. I think it's right by your chair. No, no. no? I think I put it up here. Yeah, here it is. Oh. And this is a, uh, a book printed in 1497, and it's made to look like a manuscript. Uh, it doesn't have page numbers, uh, and uh, the each uh, page um, has a, a the word of that uh, is printed uh, to indicate what the word in the next page is going to be. So they can keep things tracked out. out if you, without a page number, well, of course you wouldn't know. And this book is a book by a third century uh, Egyptian monk, hermit from, from the Sahara, I think. And uh, it was a famous book. His name is Cassianus. But, uh, it made it look like a, a manuscript. And you see that the uh, initial letters are put in by hand, uh, written in by hand with a pen. How long have you been collecting? Oh, probably 60 years. Ah. <laughs> I don't do too much of it now, but... Uh, I have bought a lot of books in my time. Any other special collections other than books? No, no I wouldn't say so. Not anything special. My wife collected antique furniture. We have a lot of antique furniture around here. 
but uh, I don't know that I could say I've collected anything much uh, besides books. Did the practice itself uh, take you on any travels of significance? Not especially, no. I, of course, had to go to Santa Fe and Albuquerque frequently for, for cases. Uh, Taos and uh, Clayton, but uh, I never left the state for any deal. I will tell you something of interest. Uh, may not rem um, not may many people remember this now, but in 1958, the state bar uh, decided that they would uh, have their meeting in Mexico City. And uh, to be uh, official about it, we spent one night in Las Cruces and then boarded a special train from uh, El Paso and went to Mexico City and spent, I think it was four or five days there, a meeting with the Barra Mexicano in Mexico City. And uh, of course, spent most of our time sightseeing and that sort of thing. But we had some sessions with the Mexican bar, and uh, I don't think that the state bar has done that anymore. That, but uh, yeah, we had they had a, uh, a New York Central uh, train. It was solid uh, bedrooms. We really enjoyed it, and uh, we zipped down to Mexico City and mm. and then came back. And it was a great deal. How many people went, went on the trip? How many people? I would say, I would say it was ten cars in this train, and uh, possibly twenty. Might have been as many as twenty people in a car. I'm not sure, positive, but a couple hundred of us. That's and a that's a pretty time. good percentage of the the bar back then, wasn't it? Yeah, and uh, of course I got to know a lot of the people that I hadn't known otherwise, even though I've been going to bar conventions a long time, but, but uh, so, you know, I can't name very many of them, but there were a lot of the prominent lawyers who were in this train. Were you fluent in Spanish? No, I was ignorant in Spanish, really. Uh, no, uh, we didn't. Ha I don't recall having had any difficulty as far as uh, uh, Spanish is concerned. Uh, really, as far as Spanish is concerned, uh, one night Catherine and I decided we wanted to go see a highlight game, and uh, so we got on the street and hailed a cab and uh, asked to go to the Highlight Stadium. And this guy didn't know what we were talking about at all. Uh, we had an awful time. Finally stopped somebody on the street and asked them, and, oh, you mean, uh, they, oh, what was the word they used? They had another name for Highlight. I was really surprised because I thought Highlight was a big uh, sport and Mexico and Spain and all over the uh, Spanish country, and uh, apparently they didn't know it in, in Mexico. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, they, they did have the game, but they just didn't call it the same. That's right, it was the same thing. Oh yeah, we we went to this big, big stadium, and and uh, you bet all during the game. Uh, you don't have to bet and quit betting at this by the beginning of the game. You. Uh, Every time one side is score, well, then a bunch of people who want to change their, or, or not necessarily change their bets, but uh, but alter their bets by putting on some more money on something else, you know. And it got very interesting there. And there were a bunch of the lawyers there, too, that hadn't gone. <laughs> Do you know if, if uh, the New Mexico Bar ever reciprocated? And I think they did. I think they did one time. I can't remember too much about that, but I believe they did.
but you pretty much made a point of going on the bar conventions when you were practicing? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the way you get acquainted with the lawyers and stuff. And at that time, well, uh, it wasn't such a big outfit that uh, uh, you couldn't, they, in the first place, it had it all over the state. We had a bar convention up here one time, and uh, uh, so, and that was when I was just becoming, i just become an assistant district attorney, and they assigned me the job of booking all the hotel rooms and stuff like that. And, so I got kind of involved there, but, uh, and, uh... What were some of the communities that you went to for bar conventions? Well, we went to Clovis, I went to uh, Hobbs, Roswell, Crucis, uh, Santa Fe, a number of times at Santa Fe, and Albuquerque, of course, uh, and, uh... Well, Tucum Carey, I think, and uh, uh, it's a little hard for me to remember all the places, but we went a lot of places. I had and realized. you get acquainted with the people there, too, and, and lawyers that were there that didn't necessarily go to other conventions. I don't think I ever realized that conventions were held really throughout the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How interesting. Good. What was the turnout typically? If you're having them in places, well, it like would turn out to be a couple hundred, and uh, we'd have a big time. Do you know what the uh, population of lawyers was back then? No, I don't. I would guess less than a thousand, but I don't know. I really don't know. Of course, Albuquerque at that time was a city of probably 50,000. And uh, I don't know how many lawyers have been there, but certainly not the number of lawyers that are there now. Right. So you really did help you meet all the lawyers throughout the state. Yes. Uh -huh. How and, wonderful. Uh, and of course, I served on some committees and stuff like that for the bar and uh, got acquainted with people more that way. Any major changes that uh, took place through the bar uh, at that well, time? Well, of course, one of the major cha changes, of course, is the fact that when you take a bar exam now, you wait six months or so to find out whether you passed or not. As I told you, well, uh, I found out the next day after the last, the last part of the examination. Uh, and I think, and I'm not positive about this now, but uh, when I applied to become a member of the bar, I had to have letters from two practicing lawyers certifying to my good character. And I don't think they require that now, do they? I think you may have to have letters, but not necessarily from lawyers, but I'm not sure. I don't know either. I have the impression when people get in that... Uh, I uh, wouldn't necessarily get a, a good review from some lawyer. I understand back in the, the 50s that there were lawyers who would give speeches on really important um, areas of the law or newly emerging issues in the law. Do you recall that? Uh, well, I think that at the bar conventions, a lot of at the bar convention, they would have discussions of that sort. And, uh, now of course, when, and I, I guess they still do it, but uh, when I went to law school, I had to write a dissertation. Um, on, and my dissertation was on uh, slip and fall uh, in uh, theaters, darkened movie theaters. And uh, that was new law then. I don't know what to do now. Hmm. Did you have to write a dissertation? Hmm. No. Oh, darn. Yeah, we had to write it. 
it released a boulder. That was the way it was. We had to write a dissertation, and uh, that's what I did. Have you continued to be active in the Bar Association since your retirement? Not, well, for a while I was, but I've uh, stopped that within the whole last 10 years. Okay. Is there um, anything that you would could pinpoint as sort of your legacy to the legal profession? <laughs> I don't, I doubt if I have any legacy to the, the legal profession. Uh, so uh, I couldn't think of anything that, that except that I tried to be a good lawyer. I tried to help people, and I tried not to uh, overcharge them. And uh, I managed to make a good living, and that's all there was to it. Okay. Well, I thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you for coming. I enjoyed it.